greatest strength and weakness of French high culture in the last few centuries has been the close connection between philosophy and poetry. Henri Bergson, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1927, was one of the great exemplars of this connection between philosophy and poetry in French culture and in high cultural thought. Um, he was a, a great kind of prose poet who simultaneously generated philosophical ideas that don't form a system and at the same time produces a, a critique, a set of questions about the contemporary status of knowledge and culture which uh, demand answers if he's not perhaps the one to necessarily answer all the questions that he generates. He does generate important questions. What he thought he discerned in nature and in the world around us is something called Elan Vital which we might describe as the life force, something that is the opposite of mere matter, uh, a thing that has a creativity, dynamism, uh, if not direction, at least motion. It is not static but dynamic, and it is the essence of all living things. It is a sort of anti-reductive or anti-naturalistic reading of Darwin. The idea being that organic nature develops, but there is something being expressed in the process of organic nature which is not merely reducible to physiochemical elements. We might think of the Elan Vital as sort of the inverse of entropy. Instead of moving towards greater and greater simplicity and greater to greater uh, lack of energy, Elan Vital is the driving force behind all of organic evolution which moves us towards greater complexity, towards greater um, towards a greater domain of activity rather than a smaller domain of activity. So Elan Vital is a sort of skeleton key, a sort of linking thread between all human and non-human animate activities and the Elan Vital is the domain which is contrasted to mere dead brute animal nature. So like so many in the French intellectual tradition, uh, Bergson is a dualist. And there are dualisms, particularly Cartesian holdovers, that run all through his philosophy. And the distinction between matter and Elan Vital, or between, uh, or Elan Vital may take the place of spirit. Matter and spirit is the big breakthrough, or the big distinction in Bergson's work. Now, he tried to distinguish uh, our scientific or objective or analytic knowledge of the external world from another kind of knowledge, and our another domain of reference, our knowledge of our immediate experiences. Bergson is primarily concerned with the interiority of the self, with the direct apprehension of the external world prior to the point where we impose concepts, ideas, mathematical or scientific formulae on the world. In some ways, he's looking at the, or he's trying to remove the cellophane of conceptual interpretation that we impose on the world and that we think constitutes the world itself and look back at the ur stuff, the, kind of the, the substance of phenomenological experience of immediate personal apprehension. Now the problem that Bergson is going to characteristically run into is that it's very hard to create literal speech about the interiority, about the things that are not publicly accessible but only accessible or only facts of individual personal experience. He's going to have a hard time making the jump from these internal subjective facts of interiority and subjectivity towards the external world. And what he will do in the process of trying to make references to interiority, to subjectivity, and to the content of experience, he will give us metaphors, images, analogies, anything but literal speech. On the one hand, we might say that that's the great defect of this sort of a project. It doesn't lend itself to literal speech and it leaves us un uncertain as to what he exactly he's referring to. On the other hand, if you wish to give more or to take more seriously this project of prose poetry, since after all we do it with figures like Nietzsche, perhaps there's something to be learned by these metaphors and images and poetic references which can gesture at some other way of thinking about knowledge and human experience which will serve to inform and alter our understanding of the external world. Now, Bergson produced a whole wide variety of books over 30 years and three or four of them stand out as being extremely influential. The first of his books that got a great deal of attention was published in 1903. It was called uh, The Introduction of Metaphysics. And I remember in particular, this had a great influence on me when I was in college. It's not the kind of thing that one usually gets assigned, and I wasn't assigned it at, at the time. I was just reading it for my own pleasure. And I remember being struck by a remarkable phrase, and to this day it's stuck with me. The idea that he proposes in this Introduction of Metaphysics is the following. 
Metaphysics is the science which claims to dispense with symbols. Now I remember at the age of 20 or 21 having no idea what that could possibly mean. A little bit older, hopefully a little wiser, I have some idea of what it might mean having gone back and read Bergson and made a certain degree of sense out of it. But Bergson has a great gift for formulating kind of enigmatic, paradoxical, peculiar thoughts in a very poetic and attractive way. So Bergson sort of straddles the line between poetry and philosophy, like so many of the great figures in French high culture. And that's something to be borne in mind whenever we go back reading him. Don't ask for more precision, logical or linguistic, than this sort of intellect can possibly offer you. A second important work of his is called Creative Evolution, which is a sort of inter interpretation of the process of Darwinian evolution in a non-mechanistic, non-naturalistic way. What makes evolution creative is the fact that it contains Elan Vital, this anti-mechanical, anti-naturalistic, anti-entropic force, which means that if uh, evolution doesn't have a purpose, it at least has dynamism, motion. It's not quite as mechanical and blind and unseeing as Darwin would have suggested. Uh, two other books that are worth noting. Um, he wrote a book on laughter, which is arguably the best philosophical treatment of comedy ever written. And that in some ways suggests the richness and depth of, this, uh, of Bergson's outlook. There are very few people who concern themselves with such a wide variety of topics as Bergson did. And uh, those of you who have ever seriously thought about the problem of comedy, I will believe will agree with me that it is a particularly difficult genre to write about. It is particularly resistant to facile generalizations, and especially because we don't have Aristotle's foundational work on comedy, all we have is the part of the poetics that refers to tragedy, we don't have much of a classical connection with the theory of, tra of comedy, so Bergson's contribution along those lines is that much more important. I think it's the best book ever written on comedy. And fortunately for us, it was written in the 20th century, so it can take in things like Charlie Chaplin, as well as things like Aristophanes. So that is something we want to uh, get to, and I will cover that towards the end of my lecture. But the final, or the, the most important of his great books, is called Two Sources of Morality and Religion. And here he's trying to distinguish um, the intuitive as opposed to the analytical approach to religion and morals. One leads to dead, stultifying, static, morality and religion, the other leads towards something else, which he describes as open and creative, which is, of course, for Bergson, yeah, his way of saying that he really likes something. Anything that's open and creative, for a thinker like Bergson, that means that it's a very praiseworthy sort of endeavor. So open religion, creative morality, that's the kind of thing Bergson will approve of. And he will try and give us reasons, or if not reasons, maybe metaphors or images, which, if they do not persuade us, should at least give us a suggestion that we might want to inquire into these domains. Uh, I don't know that logical persuasion is a strong point, but the strong point of poetic images may be that they do both more and less than logical persuasion. This is what Bergson is good for. Now, think about some of the influences when we read Bergson. It'll help make a, a better sense of context for you, and it'll be easy to figure out what's all, what, what Bergson is all about. In the first case, you could say that Bergson's work is homage to Heraclitus. All right, he was the, uh, the pre-Socratic philosopher that liked change and becoming, said that all is flux. Well, Bergson is someone who's interested not in the static, but in the dynamic. Not in the fixed, but in the changeable. And in some respects, his whole philosophy is homage to becoming. Uh, Plotinus, uh, the founder of Neoplatonism, the thinker who created a sort of gooey melange between Christianity and the more mystical elements in Platonism, Bergson has often been compared to Plotinus because of the fact that he has the same tendency to, to move from unclarity off into myth itself and to bring together various kind of eclectic intellectual elements which he rounds together or brings together not on the basis of some logical coherence but rather because they serve a certain function, they give a certain wholeness to his outlook on the world. So in the same sense that uh, Plotinus is often described as a, a mystic with great respect for reasoning, I think that Bergson has something along those lines. Bergson, not surprisingly, has great respect for mysticism. Um, another source would be Descartes, 
because of the foundational certainty of the self. The self is the starting point for many of the great French philosophies. Um, it'll certainly be the case for Descartes, but we're also going to find that with Bergson. In addition, Darwin is very important because this idea of creativity, uh, of evolution, start, takes as, a pre, as its presupposition the idea of organic Darwinian evolution within nature. What he adds to Darwin is the idea of openness. There is no natural mechanism behind it. It has an entelechy, but it is an entelechy which doesn't achieve any final telos. Um, in some ways, like Gadamer, he's looking for something less um, general and less complete than Hegel's giant system where we go to the end of history, and yet doesn't want to succumb to a completely pointless, to a completely random interpretation of history. He wants something in between. He wants to hold on to the idea of organic evolution, but he wants to keep the idea of human creativity right, as adding something necessary and unavoidable to that process. Um, any of you who know William James and who know the stream of consciousness will feel very much at home with Bergson. Bergson and James were, if not, I don't believe they were personal friends, but they were very happy with each other's work. And uh, Whitehead, those of you who know Whitehead's work, the idea that process connects religion and science, well, the idea of process, of undoing the fixed nature of the world and the fixed nature of the language which refers to it, is going to be cons uh, an important concern both for Whitehead's conception of process and for Bergson's. Now, an important stimulus to Bergson's thought, and a, an important reason or important source of his questioning, his doubting of the status of, of science, is that it, he felt that it didn't maintain fidelity to the facts of human experience. And he went back to the pre-Socratics, particularly to Zeno and his paradoxes, in order to show that our scientific conceptions of space and time are inadequate and do not live up to our actual experience of space and time. And in fact, that our experience internally of space and time is quite different from the way science describes it. Let's think about Zeno's paradox. And here I'm talking about the paradox of Zeno and the arrow. Think about it this way. At each instant in the flight of an arrow, it is occupying a space exactly the size of the arrow. Right? At no, none of these instants can it occupy a space larger than its size, so there is no instant at which it can change location. So Zeno draws the inference that motion is impossible. Right? Now, we try and recoup that loss by constructing the calculus and the idea of continuity, and we manage to solve some of these paradoxes that come from uh, Zeno and come from this idea of, of instantaneous motion. Bergson does something else with it. What Bergson does is say that our experience of space and our experience of time are fundamentally different and time and space do not form a continuum the way all scientists or most scientists have been assuming. It is not merely a given right? and it is not merely an abstraction. Space and time are lived experiences and when we examine not what science tells us space and time are but when we experience space and time directly and uh, in an unmediated way, we will find that the way science handles space and time falsifies the reality of it, and this will serve to ground our movement away from science towards immediate phenomenological appreh apprehension. Let's think about um, Bergson's conception of time. Uh, as far as Bergson is concerned, time is heterogeneous, whereas space is homogeneous. Think about time, it contains various kinds of moments for you, um, as opposed to clock time. Um, as far as Bergson is concerned, all of our scientific conceptions of time are really the literalization of spatialized metaphors. For example, if I get out a stopwatch and I click it so that the hands begin to move, how do I know when 10 minutes are up? Well, when the hand has moved a particular portion across the dial. So in other words, what we're doing is judging time by motion of something th through space. Right? But Bergson's point is that space and time are very different and that science is loaded, pervaded with spatialized metaphors, particularly the spatializing of time. We think of points in time. We think of a timeline. And Bergson's point is that that's not what time is and that we need these metaphors in order to make science work. But time doesn't break up into little homogeneous units the way space does. As we experience time, Bergson calls it durée. And he says this experience of time is very different from clock time. He says somewhat enigmatically and quite poetically, it reminds me of Proust, time is the take, uh, durée is the, is, the experience, is the experience of time when, it, when sugar is dissolving in my tea. 
right? Um, it's one thing to take out a stopwatch and watch the hand go around, but while that may be happening simultaneously with the duration of my tea getting its sugar, the point is that one is describing time and experience of the world from the inside, the other from the outside. One is talking about the direct apprehension of, spa of temporality, the other based upon a metaphor, a spatial metaphor for what temporality is. So Bergson says, let's move into our direct experience of space and time, leaving science by the wayside, bracket that for a while. If it, we'll go back and use science for whatever it turns out to be handy for, but it is a sure thing that space and time are very definite, definitely different things, and the way we experience experience them is different, and when we try and treat space and time as a continuous whole, we end up with the paradoxes of Zeno. So the way he wants to get out of the paradoxes of Zeno is to undo the space-time continuum, and says that space and time are fundamentally different. Space, uh, all objects in the world are connected in time, but they're separated in space. Time is heterogeneous, whereas space is homogeneous. Uh, time is irreversible, space is reversible. Time is irreplaceable. Space is replaceable. Time is unique. Uh, space is not unique. Time is dynamic. Space is static. So he it it creates a whole set of dualisms that correspond to the distinction between space and time, and he is undoing the space-time continuum with the intention of, of reformulating our description of the way we experience the world and using that as the source for our cri criticism and appreciation of other alt intellectual alternatives. Now, um, you might want to say that, I mean, even though uh, Heidegger did not know Bergson, or Bergson didn't know Heidegger because Bergson is a generation older, you might want to say that Durey is the temporality of, da of Dasein in the sense that it's the way people directly apprehend the externality of time. And you might want to say that Durey is not the spatialized time of clocks, but it's the real Husserlian experience of time. Husserl wrote a whole book called The Phenomenology of Internal Time Consciousness. The point being that internal time, the way we experience it, and external time, the way we spatialize it in metaphors, fundamentally different. Now, I said that Bergson's philosophy was dualistic, and it turns out that he established a homologous series of dualisms that run all through his philosophy, um, and these dualisms correspond to the distinctions between mind and matter, which corresponds to the distinction between accident and essence, which corresponds to the distinction between science and metaphysics, space and time, body and soul, matter and memory, analysis and intuition, and intelligence and instinct. So there's a dualism the split between the internal world and the external world that never gets recovered for Bergson. He thinks it's what makes possible this critique of science. Now, let's start off with his distinction between analysis and intuition. Now, we've, all, we've had various problems with intuition before because we found, at least in some cases, that it can be quite subjective, quite nebulous, very difficult to articulate. Um, we might want to connect it with a uh, the work of R.G. Collingwood. Those of you who know Professor Stalov's lecture on Collingwood's idea of history know that Collingwood makes a distinction between the inside of an event and the outside of an event, between looking at an activity from the perspective of the agent or from the perspective of someone on the outside. And when we look at it from the perspective of the agent, we are changing our perspective, changing the way we look at it, and we are adopting a common human perspective that, uh, that Collingwood calls empathy or intuition. Bergson is suggesting that intuition does something like that. It's something we all have in common. It is elemental and prior to analysis. All right. Now, what analysis does is objectively move around its object. It investigates things from the outside. And what we need to do if we're going to measure things from the outside is we need things like measuring instruments, clocks, all the... Uh, uh, we need a whole set of literalized spatial metaphors, clocks and things like that, measuring instruments, so that we can impose concepts on the external world. And these concepts are pragmatic fictions which we use to manipulate the world, but which do not represent the way we experience it directly. The way we experience the world directly is called intuition. And in contrast to analysis, which moves around its object and is relative, intuition enters into its object and it's absolute. So here's where the Collingwoodian element comes in. Now, what, what Bergson says is something along these lines. This is why intuition is so important to him, that intuition is an entering into an object which does not need to be mediated by symbols. In other words, rather than have me explain to you what 15 minutes or 20 minutes of time is, you can actually experience what that is intuitively without watching a clock for you, so you can find out on the basis of the space of those hands how much time is elapsing. 
Right? Intuition, then, is our direct apprehension of the world. And Bergson thinks, then, that the problem with earlier metaphysics is that they continue the problem of intellectual homogenization and analysis, rather than going back to this Urstoff, this uh, direct apprehension of this world, this intuition. And in the earlier metaphysics, um, the static categories like Kant's a priori categories of the mind, or uh, a Democritus's atoms or Descartes' clear and distinct ideas all suffer from the, tr from the fact that they are trying to perform analysis within the domain of intuition. Right? They are trying to make metaphysics mediated by concepts. And the point is, these concepts all adhere to the external world, not to the internal world. Concepts have to do with objectively analyzing the world. They are not part of durée, or they are not part of uh, intuition. Intuition directly apprehends the world without the use of words or symbols. So that's what he meant in the beginnings of his book called An Introduction to Metaphysics, when he says that metaphysics is the science that claims to dispense with symbols. He says that metaphysics is the, is the science of the things that we directly apprehend. It's the science of intuition, or more precisely, it is human experience. It is prior to our constructions of the physical world. So metaphysics precedes physics in that sense. Intuition precedes analysis. All right. Now let's take some examples of intuition because it's a very nebulous concept and all these prose poets have the characteristic difficulty that it's hard to pin them down, hard to figure out literally what they're saying most of the time. He says, so Bergson gives us some very nice examples and here's where he's really at his best because much of his metaphysics is kind of mushy and hazy but the examples he gives are quite suggestive. In the first case, let's think of going to Paris. The direct, or okay, well you've been there. It's a wonderful city. To go to Paris is a fundamentally different experience from being shown all the possible photographs of Paris from every possible perspective. Suppose I give you a tremendous stack of photos of Paris. Well, if you think of those photos as representing Paris as it is, rep as it is indicated by concepts, they become flat and two-dimensional and square. Well, they are forced into a Procrustean mold which does not do justice to the living reality of Paris. Well, what Bergson will say is that intuition is what happens to you when you go to Paris and experience Paris. You might want to analyze some element in Paris, say the architecture of Paris or the characteristic uh, road map of Paris or whatever you want to do through this set of images or representations, but no set of images or representations, no stack of photographs of Paris, no matter how big the stack is, is ever going to be a replacement for the, the immediate experience of going to Paris. Right? Um, even if I send you lots of, fo of postcards for my vacation, I'm the one going on vacation. Right? And there's no doubt in your mind about that. Right? It's a very different sort of experience. Try another exa example of something intuited. The self. I have a direct intuition of my own existence, of my own consciousness, and I don't need to have symbols mediate that for me. In other words, I don't have to go to anyone and ask them, do I exist? Am I a self? I know that directly. I apprehend that directly. Compare that to the analytic parsing of the self that we get in various psychoanalytic theories. Maybe I have an id. Maybe I don't. Maybe I have a superego, maybe I don't. But the whole set of parsings, the whole set of concepts, which one would hope in a kind of general theory of the psyche, would account for the various modes of human uh, activity, uh, moods, feelings, sentiments, all that. All of those theoretical constructs cannot replace the direct intuition of being me or being you. You intuit that directly. So there is always some discrepancy between our conceptual analytic representation of anything and our direct uh, intuitive apprehension of that thing, provided it's the kind of thing that we can intuitively apprehend. Not everything can be done that way, but some things are like that. He also gives, gives another example, or a third example, um, the idea of a hero of a novel. All right. It's one thing to read a novel, say The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe, right, and, and to feel and to find out what Werther is really like. Another thing to have me tell you about the novel. Right, I'll use some concepts like, a, I don't know, a protagonist or antagonist. I'll use concepts like the novel. I'll talk about the genre. I'll talk about his dispositions and his psychic states and his behaviors. None of those descriptions of Werther will be like your direct apprehension of what Werther is like when you experience that work of art. So it seems then that there are certain things which are not done justice when we try and describe them using analytic concepts, using our rationality. And 
it's hard to know how to evaluate this sort of a claim because it seems to have elements of truth and also very dubious elements built into it too. And the problem with Bergson is that he oftentimes doesn't bother to give us a formal logical argument. He's a prose poet, m to be compared with someone like Nietzsche, for example, who gives you interesting ideas to think about and then you don't know, quite know how to evaluate them. At the, uh, so when he's talking about instinct, he says that instinct is to intelligence or analysis as vision is to touch. You know, this instinct tells you things at a long distance. And then perhaps you can reason about them later on when you come up close, and that'll be making them more tangible and substantial. But intuition is greatly superior to and goes beyond the domain of mere analysis and more, mere reasoning. How do we substantiate that? I don't know. Uh, the best I can tell, uh, the best argument that I can make is that Bergson, because he has this poetic tendency and sees various intellectual difficulties cropping up in modern scientific society, is trying to formulate a philosophical alternative. And this philosophical alternative will revolve around the idea of creativity, the idea of subjectivity, the idea of interiority, and the idea of elan vital. Okay. Finally, Bergson says, to think intuitively is to think in duration. And no image or concept is identical with duration. And yet, nonetheless, Bergson will tell us that duration is, after all, a concept, and that nothing is actually quite capable of getting that idea across to us. So he leaves us with various kinds of poetic paradoxes, telling us that no concept is adequate to express duration. But, well, how else will he tell us about it? So he would like to emphasize subjectivity, but must make concessions to the objective world so he can com communicate with us. And when he does so, he forces himself into language. He's slippery enough to move into metaphorical and poetic language, but he is forced into the domain of language and analysis nonetheless, at least some of the time. Now, another important work by Bergson, and which shows sort of the optimistic and kind of poetic ten tendencies in his thought, is called Two Sources of Morality and Religion. And this is where he makes his argument for Elan Vital and for the reality of our moral feelings or moral sentiments and for the, serious, the intellectual seriousness of religion. And what he says is something like this. Elan Vital works through history, but it's not mechanical and it's not purely naturalistic. It's something like um, Geist in, Hege in Hegel's sense, but without the telos, without the eschaton, the end of history. And it's also something like Darwin's conception of nature, uh, of natural evolution, natural selection. But it's not mechanical, it's not blind, and it allows for real novelty and creativity. Um, oftentimes, it seems that what Bergson is trying to do is have his cake and eat it too. It seems like he's very impressed with Darwinian naturalism and he's very impressed with the theory of evolution. Feels that the human condition w has been fundamentally changed by the advent of Darwinism. Now after he has his cake then he wants to eat it too. He says we don't want to be completely rejoined with the natural world if the price of rejoining the natural world is to eliminate freedom, eliminate novelty, and eliminate the interiority that makes human beings human. So he constructs this second way of looking at evolution as being creative rather than mechanical, at least potentially, and saying this is what will establish the special qualities of human existence as opposed to the existence of other animals which may fit into that Darwinian model. Now, in the first case he talks about the sources of morality and religion. And the first source of morality and religion is the external world, nature. And we impose analysis on the external world to get what we want, and we generate the first stage of religion, which he calls static religion. And static religion are the ancient myths and codes of behavior which were constructed as a way out of the misery of human life. In other words, if you can imagine what a sociobiological or very naturalistic interpretation of human history would tell us about religion, it would say that people are terrified by the world. It's full of pain and misery and anxiety and problems. So Bergson makes the argument, I think which most people would agree with, that the source, uh, the archaic sources of religion particularly in this case, what he calls static religion, are in human needs, and they interact with nature to construct accounts of nature which are not very persuasive or sophisticated, but they serve the function then of maintaining social cohesion, advancing the survival of the species, and allowing for the integration of society. Corresponding to this static religion, Bergson thinks there's something called closed morality. And closed morality is that system of imperatives, that system of moral rules, which is connected to static religion and which derives from the same source as static religion, the simple need for human community, which requires laws, which requires regulation, um, which requires analysis 
and rigidity for its effectiveness to become manifest. Now, there's a second source of morality or religion, and this is Bergson's big contribution, or at least this is what he thinks his big contribution is. He says that in addition to the static religion and the closed morality of ancient societies where people had just, were just pulling themselves out of the domain of nature, there's a second alternative which we get not through analysis but through, elan, through intuition and not through natural selection but through elan vital. And these alternative, the alternative to static religion is what he calls dynamic religion and the alternative to closed morality is what he calls open morality. And dynamic religion and, dynam and open morality both have their source in intuition and here's where Bergson makes his homage or kind of a, makes his uh, affirmation of mysticism. He says that within dynamic religion, and this is true not just within the Western tradition of religion, but in all the world's religions, that all the great mystics are something like spiritual pioneers who break through the old, static, stultifying forms of religion towards some new, higher and finer intuition. His idea of uh, the great and uh, mystics who broke through the established bounds of religion are people like St. Paul, St. Francis, and if you think about the idea of mysticism as at least potentially leading outside the bounds of religion as a heteronymous in the Kantian sense activity, making possible autonomy, I think that Bergson, unlike Kant, thinks that the source of this autonomous religion and autonomous morality will not be in reasoning, it will be in intuition. It will be in our direct pre-linguistic apprehension of the world. In other words, we see right and wrong. And some of us apparently have a di more direct apprehension of that and can instruct the others. And when this instruction becomes social, religion moves from being static to dynamic. Uh, morality moves from being closed, a rigid set of systems, to an open set that at least allows for a greater domain of human freedom. Right? And this is always the product of intuition, never the product of any kind of analytical activity. Now, one might imagine that, I mean, having said, I mean, made such great claims, that Bergson would go on and try and argue this very carefully in some sort of historical sense. In other words, he ought, I would expect, being a historian, to give us the actual people and places, the dates and times and events, which show us this transformation. And, He's awfully light on that. Uh, the specifics are never Bergson's strong point. He makes these arguments because he's trying to have, he's trying to, if not revive religion and morality based upon direct personal intuition, he's certainly trying to legitimize it or prevent it from being dropped by the wayside with the advent of 20th century thought. Connected with this sort of optimistic project, with this kind of uh, can I put it, unique project, because there's really no one like Bergson in 20th century thought, is his writing on comedy. And however dubious or nebulous or questionable his treatment of morality and religion and knowledge are, his writings on comedy are arguably the best things ever written on the genre. It's a very difficult topic. Um, what Bergson says is something along these lines. He says that, uh, well, he tries to, argue, uh, to articulate a necessary and sufficient condi uh, condition for comedy, and he says that laughter, strangely enough, is a function of intelligence. Since after all, only people laugh. You never see dogs laughing. No point in telling them a joke. So only people laugh, and it has something to do with the fact that people are intelligent. And in addition, perhaps this is again the kind of genial or attractive element in, in Bergson, he says that laughter and comedy serve a moral function, and that's why society invented them. And also that's why they're universal. Amazingly enough, there's no society that hasn't invented the joke, which suggests perhaps that there is some commonality underlying our various cultural experiences. Let's think about it this way. Let's com contrast tragedy and comedy to see the difference. Tragedy individuates. In other words, think about something like Hamlet. When Hamlet dies at the end of Hamlet, he is specifically dead on account of Hamlet's tragic flaws, right? He has these Oedipal feelings towards his mother, and he's very indecisive, and he thinks too much. But Hamlet is specifically Hamlet. Every tragedy, or tragedy generally, ends in death, and death always individuates, pulls the tragic hero away from society, makes the tragic hero separate, makes him an epitome of his sins, and offers him the, the appropriate agony for his sins, or his transgressions, his flaws. What's interesting about tragedy is that it's always about individuals. Imagine what would happen if we wanted to retitle Hamlet and title it The Indecisive Oedipal Guy. <laughs> right, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's exactly a comic response. It's funny because Hamlet is not about an indecisive Oedipal Guy. It's about Hamlet. Let's try uh, the same sort of idea. Let's think of Othello. Othello is Othello, a great heroic man who's 
destroyed by his own jealousy. We could not go back and retitle Othello, The Story of the Jealous Guy. Why? Because Othello is about Othello. It is not a, about a type of a person. It is not about a characteristic moral deformity. It is about Othello's moral deformity. It is about Hamlet's moral deformity. It is about King Lear's moral deformity. It is about some specific quality of each of these figures. Tragic heroes are individuals. Now, here's where Bergson gets real deep, and I think he's, I mean, this is where he's at his best. He's so sensitive and smart. He says, comedy works exactly the opposite way. It's deep. Comedy does not end in death. On the whole, comedy ends in marriage. Perhaps sex and death of the two, sex and death of the two poles of human life, and I would be inclined to say that marriage is symbolic sex. So what comedy does when the comic hero is married and at the end of the comedy, he is reintegrated back into society. So instead of being killed off and individuated, exactly the opposite happens. He gets collectivized, he gets thrown back into the mix so that he can have sex and then produce more little comic heroes and they can get thrown back into the mix. Right? So comedy gestures at collectivity, tragedy gestures at individuality. It's a deep argument. It goes even further. He says, not only that, but comedy is never about individual people. Car co corresponds to the comic hero. Comedy is always about kinds or types of people. Think of Moliere, the miser. Not Joe, the miserly man. Rather, the miser. He's a type of person. Imagine the misanthrope. We're not talking about someone that doesn't like other people. We're talking about misanthropy in general. Right? Comedy refers to types, to generalities. It doesn't refer to specific individuals, which is connected to the way comedy and tragedy finish up and their function in society. It's a very, very deep argument. So he says then, comedy is about generalities. It is morally instructive and didactic. The point of the miser is to hold miserliness or stinginess up to ridicule by making it appear, appear as foolish as it in fact is. It is morally didactic as well. And then he makes out a, a, a sort of, how can I put it, he offers us the structure of comedy. Not only does he stand on the outside of it and talk about what comedy does and compared to things like tragedy, he talks about the structure of comic action itself. And he makes a number of observations about the infamous banana peel. You know, when someone's walking down the street and slips on a banana peel and falls flat on their butt, People think that's funny, they laugh, or at least some of the time they do. Bergson asks the interesting question, why? What's funny about that? I mean, we all laugh, we all think it's kind of funny to, get hit, to slip on a banana peel. Why is it we find that humorous? And he says, first of all, that we only find it humorous if nobody gets hurt. If someone falls and breaks their leg, we don't find that funny, we think that's pathetic. So first things first, we have to make sure that there's no real harm. Right? Because then we have to have a certain sense of empathy with the comic hero, because it turns out the comic hero is just like us. We don't want bad things to happen to them. A second observation about comedy is that what makes the banana peel and the fall funny is that it's human beings, or spirit, or Alain Vital forgetting itself and acting like matter. In other words, he says the essence of all comedy is things that are not material, Alain Vital acting like wood. In other words, when you fall flat on your butt, that's funny because you are acting as if you were purely an object. All right? So, that, in other words, things that are not objects, people acting like objects is what comedy is about, he says. And he also makes the argument there are certain structural rules for comedy, which is a very interesting thought. First of all, things like repetition. Uh, remember that old uh, Abbott and Costello gag, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third? Right? Um, what they do is they repeat things endlessly, and it's the frustration that we see the person who's not understanding the dialogue go through that we find amusing. Why? Because he's not catching on. He's acting like meat, like wood. He's acting not like a person, but like a dummy. I might as well be talking to the wall. Who's on first? What's on second? There's no communication really going on. The repetition is key to comedy. A second structural element in comedy, according to Bergson, is inversion. This is the inversion of roles. Uh, if you know the, that Indiana Jones movie, where some guy with a sword comes out and confronts Indiana Jones and he's waving the sword around and threatening him and it looks like it's bad for Indiana and Indiana says and he just takes out his gun and shoots him. He says forget it. Inversion of roles. For a second Indiana Jones was the prey, then he turns into the predator. That's funny because it's an inversion of roles. Bergson is really onto something here. A third structural rule of comedy is reciprocity. In other words, we have to have the reciprocal influence of series. What it means is something like this. We, uh, we, make a, we create a mistaken connection between two unrelated series of events and some sort of ambiguity makes us misinterpret that. If you've read any of the plays of Oscar Wilde, 
right? The importance of being earnest. Everybody's talking past everybody else. What we get is the interference of different series of events which are misinterpreted by people that really don't know what's going on. So that's going to be important in the structural rules of comedy as well. Beyond this, Ver uh, Bergson also analyzes verbal comedy. And he says that within language, or that there's verbal comedy within language and then just merely expressed in language. Let me give you some examples. Um, within language, Comedy is usually untranslatable. Think about something like a, know, uh, the, old, uh, the old joke, take my wife, please. Well, unless you have exactly the grammar of English, it might be very hard to translate that into Arabic. Right? Take my wife, please, may not get big laughs in Arabic. It hardly gets any laughs now. Right? He said it's the lamest joke. I mean, it's a prehistoric joke, but it's, it has to do with the structure of the English language itself. He says that's one kind of verbal comedy. The other kind of verbal comedy is the kind that is merely expressed in the language, which means that in principle it is translatable. And he gives a couple of examples of that. First of all, it's the literal translate interpretation of metaphors. He says that's funny because metaphors can't be literally interpreted. That translates just fine. It's just that that leads to all kinds of inter misinterpretation and uh, incoherence, and that is comic. The transposition of meanings. When you take away the importance of being earnest, for example, earnest is a character, and earnest is also a, quali a disposition of the soul. If you transpose the meanings of earnest, you can get a lot of mileage out of that. Oscar Wilde already has. And then he makes a distinction between comic words and witty words. Comic words, you laugh at the utterer. Right? When, when somebody says something co that's comic, you laugh at the person that's making the utterance. When somebody says something that's witty, you're either laughing at a third person or you're laughing at yourself. He has a fairly elaborate taxonomy of the ways in which comedy might work, and I think that it's not quite a substitute for Aristotle, but it's clearly about as good an encyclopedic treatment as I've ever seen, and it's something worth your consideration. If you're going to just study Bergson, if you're just studying philosophy for the enjoyment of it, I believe that you will find his book on laughter very rewarding. I haven't met anyone that didn't find it funny, as well as illuminating and enlightening. Let's look overall and then at comedy, figure out what Bergson has to say. He says, first of all, the, com the comic is that side of a person which reveals his likeness to a thing. When you slip on the banana peel, it's just like the podium falling down. You're being turned into an object. And when you move from being a person to an object, that demotion is the comic experience. The imperfection of human beings, their ability to forget themselves, their ability to forget what they are, demands a social corrective. This social corrective is called comedy. In other words, we laugh at people to remind them that they're souls rather than bodies. And when, in other words, if you, remember the, if you know any of the, uh, the justifications for restoration comedy in England, because the Puritans didn't like comedy, they thought that it was immoral and it led to uh, you know, moral depravity, those who wanted to defend comedy during the restoration said, no, comedy has uh, a morally didactic purpose. It allows, it allows us to hold up vice to ridicule and improve the spectator. Well, Bergson's argument for comedy runs more or less along those lines. He says that what it holds up is human deformity, our tendency to slip back into nature slip back into the world of the object, slip back into the world of matter. And what laughter does is remind you that you shouldn't do that, that that's not what you are. It's society's way of reminding that you're, that you're a soul rather than a body. As can be seen from the wide variety of the topics that Bergson pursues, the, the great subtlety and poetry and also haziness of his ideas, and the, the generally, how can I put it, generally metaphorical or, uh, how can I put it, uh, aesthetic quality to his writings mean that on the one hand we might be tempted to dismiss him out of hand, but it seems that if we do that we will be throwing the baby out with the bathwater because we will be losing the insights that he offers us within the domain that is his strong point, which is aesthetics. In other words, he's a very poetic kind of a figure, Bergson. Bergson has a, a great subtlety of mind. I don't know that rationality or reasoning is his strong point, but he is able to discern things underlying, for example, the structure of comedy, which most of us would have had a real hard time with. So, his strong point is his aesthetic treatments, his occasionally very insightful and very, very thought-provoking metaphors, and his weak point is the fact that he never provides us with the argument that would make us convinced or feel uh, some sort of certainty or some sort of uh, surety that the argument he's making about the distinction between static and dynamic religion or open and closed morality really had any more validity than Bergson's wishful thinking. My feeling then is that Bergson is unique in the 
20th century domain, in the domain of 20th century thought. He's optimistic for the most part rather than pessimistic. He is respectful of science without being uh, worshipful towards science. And he brings together the strongest and weakest points of French high culture in the 20th century. Its tendency to undo the distinction between poetry and philosophy, which leads us to persuasive images and powerful metaphors, if not logical certainty and apodictic truth.